leading us in worship. Let's get back here. Well, welcome. Welcome to Veritas Dubuque. Um, if you're new here, we are excited to meet you. I was just talking to Israel before, and he said he thought he saw a lot of new faces. So definitely come up and meet myself or Israel or John or meet somebody if you're new here. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and get to know you, get to know your name. Um, you can open your Bibles to Genesis 32. That's where we're going to be today. If you want to get there um, or turn on your phone and flip to Genesis 32. Um, my task was to preach a sermon on Genesis 25 through 35. But instead of being here for seven hours, I figured I would kind of hone it down a little bit. So Genesis 32 is where we're going to be today. Um, and like I said, if you're new, and if you're new to the Christian faith too, um, I think this is going to be an interesting message. Um, I think this, this text might break down some misconceptions about our faith. Um, and even if you are a believer, maybe you're a longtime believer in Jesus, you still might have some misconceptions to be broken down today. So the title of this sermon, I don't always title my sermons, but I titled this one, is Rethinking Blessing. So here's the question I have for you today. Do you want to be blessed? You think, well, yeah, of course. That's a good thing, right? And then you maybe think, wait, why is he asking this question? Maybe he's trying to trick us because the title is Rethinking Blessing. Well, I am kind of trying to trick you a little bit because I think the real question, the question isn't do you want to be blessed? That's too easy of a question. The real question is, are you willing to be blessed? That's a different question. What happens to someone when they're blessed? We're going to find out. We're going to learn from Jacob's experience. So, like I said, I'm, I'm whittling down a big chunk of Bible today. So I'm going to give you a really quick context on, on our specific text today. And just bear with me. If I leave something out and you know it, then, you know, Bear with me a little bit, but I'm going to try to get the, the main points we need to know. So we need to know about the two main characters, Jacob and his twin brother Esau. Okay, so these are, these are twins, and Jacob is the, the younger twin. He came out second, and Esau was born first, so he, he's the firstborn. And one of the main themes here is going to be blessing. That's going to be one of the main themes because there's a big question their father is Isaac, and who's going to get the, the blessing from Isaac? And usually it would be the firstborn. Usually the firstborn gets the inheritance, they get the blessing. But God had prophesied something, that the, the older would serve the younger. When they were twins in, in their mother Rebecca's womb, they were like wrestling each other, and God kind of spoke to her and said, the older will serve the younger. There's a wrestling match, there's a struggle going on in your womb. And then we see these names, Jacob and Esau. So the name Jacob is like heel grabber. That's like what it literally meant in Hebrew. And that's like this figure of speech for like grabbing someone's heel. It's like tripping them up or like usurping someone and, and kind of tricking out of their power. So Jacob, I, I like to think of Jacob as trickster. That's basically what that name means. Like his, his name is like if you say the word trickster. And then Esau, I love this name. It basically means red and hairy. He came out and they were like, look at this baby. He's red and he's hairy. Let's call him Red Harry. So that's, that's how Esau gets his name. It's like a combination of two words, but that's basically what it is. So who's going to get the blessing? Well, Jacob has basically tricked Esau out of the blessing. That's what happens in their life. And so then Jacob flees and Esau is threatening to, to murder him. It's pretty dark. It's pretty intense. You know, typical brother stuff. And then Jacob has schemed to get this blessing. At least he thinks he's got the blessing. And now where we're going to pick up is actually the night before the reunion of these two brothers. Long story short, Jacob goes out, gets prosperity, and now he's kind of forced back into a reunion with his technically older twin brother Esau. And Jacob has tricked him out of his blessing. And the last he knew of Esau, Esau was murderously angry at him. So Jacob's a little nervous, understandably so. And one thing that he does is um, Jacob has this prayer. 
So in, in Genesis 32, 9 through 12, just quickly touch on this. He, he, he prays and, you know, it's a decent prayer. I mean, as far as prayers go, not to be too critical of it. He, he does say, you know, God, your will be done. And he does proclaim his humility. But a lot of scholars really note that the main burden of his prayer is really kind of protect me from Esau. I'm scared of him. And give me the blessing because you kind of promised you would, God. You know, kind of hold up your end of the bargain here, God. I kind of want this blessing. If he kills me, it, I don't know how that's going to work. So Jacob is still a little more concerned about himself and his blessing and his well-being when he prays to God. And he prays two very specific things. Protect me from Esau. And then he asks for this, this blessing. And so then right after that, he sends all these gifts to Esau and he doesn't really get a message back. The, the messengers he sends to Esau are like, yeah, he didn't say anything, but he's just coming towards you with like 400 men. So they're like, okay. Esau might still be pretty mad at Jacob. And now our text is Genesis 32, 24 through 32. So this is God's answer to Jacob's prayer. Jacob prays for this protection from Esau. He's like, Esau's going to attack me. And I want this blessing. Well, how does God answer that prayer? Genesis 32, 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket. Some translations say touched Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled, and he dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said. Yet my life has been spared. The sun shone on him as he passed by Penuel, limping because of his hip. That is why still today the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is at the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket at the thigh muscle. So in the Old Testament, we get a lot of what I would call passionless narrative. It's just this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, right? It's just describing the events. And it kind of lays it out there for us to think about it, you know. It doesn't exactly fill in a lot of details. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to read through it once more and fill in what I think are some, some of the details that bring this story to life a little bit more. So Jacob is left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. The man sought out Jacob. And when the man saw that he could not defeat him, notice the irony here. He, he touched his hip socket and dislocated his hip. This man was obviously holding something back in the wrestling match. And maybe not defeat him is a little more like he saw the man wasn't willing to give up. And then he said to Jacob, let me go for this daybreak. Something really interesting here. This man does not want to be seen in the light of day by Jacob. That's the cue we get for why he needs to go. And we know that seeing God's face is a dangerous thing. It's hard for us sinful humans to see the fullness of God. So there's something here. It's daybreak. Let me go. And then we see, I think to say that Jacob said this with his newly dislocated hip is maybe, maybe he cried this. Maybe he was begging and pleading, no. I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. You might think that's kind of a strange question. Why is he asking his name at this point? Well, what's Jacob's name mean? Trickster, right? Sinner, thief. What is your name? 
the most embarrassing answer is the honest answer Jacob gives. Jacob. And then God says, no, your name will no longer be Jacob. He said, it will be Israel. Now this name Israel is, is a hard one to translate. People are all over with this, but the, the text here tells us why he names it that. So this is kind of where I derive my meaning of this name Israel. Your name will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Now, if you were an Israelite hearing the retellings of this story, and Moses is the one that eventually kind of, we think Moses kind of went back and put the, the Old Testament together. So these are their stories of how their history came into being. And if you were a kid hearing these stories, you just heard the word Israel. That is your nation. You are an Israelite. You're like, oh, I've always wondered where that name came from. This story is where that name came from. God renames him Israel, and that is where this whole nation got their name. So this is an important moment for these people. This is the name of their people group, and, and you're like, wait, this is how he got that name? God just picked a guy who's like this trickster and, and finally decided to bless him? I think that teaches us something about God. And so, so Jacob asks the man his name, and we know it's God as we kind of see the story now after the fact, but in the moment, I think even Jacob knew at this point that it was God, which is why I think he says, why do you ask my name? You know my name. But instead of answering, he shows him his name by blessing him. He shows him his character by blessing him. So Jacob names the place Penio, which means face of God. And then we're going to get to this phrase later on. The sun shone by him as he passed by Penuel, the face of God, limping because of his hip. It's a beautiful picture. And then, that is why still today the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle. So, little note on that. Here again, the narrator is speaking directly to the Israelite people. It's like, yeah, every time we butcher the animal and don't eat that, this part of the animal, this is what we're thinking about. The moment God broke Jacob's hip. So it's obviously something important for them to hang on to. So that's the text with a, a little of, of my commentary. I hope that's somewhat helpful. And so we come back to this question. Do you want to be blessed? Are you willing to be blessed? The story is, is starting to maybe stir up some different questions. So I'm going to focus on three plot points of this story that teach us about what's it like to be blessed? What's it like in Jacob's experience to be blessed? Well, Jacob's left alone, and the man wrestled with him until daybreak. This is the first honest thing Jacob has done in his whole life, is wrestle God. When you read this story leading up to this point, you see Jacob constantly tricking, lying. His life, my theory is, his life is basically like this metaphorical wrestling match with God. Like he's trying to get this blessing that God is like, I was going to give this to you anyways. And Jacob's trying to earn it. He's trying to earn it. It's like this metaphorical wrestling match with God. And now finally, it's like he just wrestles with God. It's like, finally. It's like, I was thinking about this. Sometimes you see two boys on the playground and they're kind of arguing and they're just kind of passive aggressive talking. And it's like, you know what, you two just need to fight. You two just got to fight it out. Just get it over with. And I'm not saying they actually should fight. I don't know, maybe. Some boys need a little bit of, some boys need a little bit of physical love. But it's like that feeling is like, no, you know what, it would be more honest for you two to just face each other and fight than to just keep passive aggressively talking about each other. So that's my feeling reading the Jacob story leading up to this. I'm like, Jacob, dude, you just got to wrestle it out with God. Like you're, you're trying to take this stuff on your own. You just got to go to the source, man. Well, he does. So plot point one that we need to see is it takes honesty. And it might take even for you wrestling with God to come to blessing. 
You have to face God. And it's a scary thing because we're going to see what happens next. But you have to embrace the debate, embrace the discussion, embrace the struggle, right? Jacob, this wrestling match, this struggle, you have to embrace that. So the next thing we see, the man saw that he could not defeat him, but he struck Jacob's hip socket and dislocated his hip. Obviously, God was holding something back. He touched the hip and it goes out of place. And he had to show Jacob, he had to get his attention before he could show him what blessing is. He had to do something to kind of wake him up and rattle him a little bit. And maybe he was testing Jacob's strength by letting him wrestle through the night. And like I said, he kind of persists through this wrestling match. And it's maybe this this moment of testing. Would he persist? Would he keep going? But then it was time to get his attention. And when he did, he left a lasting mark. You guys, pain gets our attention like nothing else. You can miss joy, pleasure, happiness. You can't miss pain. You cannot ignore it. And it sounds a little harsh. And it almost doesn't make sense. But I think, we, I think it's crucially important that we stop at this point in the story and sit and stare at this. The second plot point is... God wounded Jacob. Before we say, oh, but it was good. Right now, we just have to sit and say, yes. Sometimes this is hard to accept. You look at this story and you're like, yeah, he did. He just reached out and dislocated his hip. Like God caused pain for Jacob. That's hard. I'm not trying to make this sound like I have a good feeling about this either myself. How can a loving God let someone experience pain? Well, like I said, we have to say it plain, uh, plainly and clearly before we can move on because we have to accept it. And you actually have to accept it for this whole sermon to make sense. And I would say, I've been wounded by God. And probably a lot of you would say, you have felt that feeling. And I would also say, you know what? Don't take that away from me. Those wounds have taught me some of the greatest lessons I've learned. Okay, I'll, you know, spare you the whole story, but I feel like I basically got an entire dream career of music ripped out of my hands by God. And I say it now and it sounds kind of silly. At the time, I was on my kitchen floor completely in tears because I'm like, I know that's what God is doing. This isn't what he has for me but I don't want to let it go, but I did. And it's the best thing. Don't take it away from me. That pain that I felt is so important to my faith. I think something to help think about this, you think about a surgeon, right? The surgeon is going to do something good for you, but they're going to come at you with a scalpel first before they can get any good work done. But it's also important in that analogy that you have a real surgeon do that. Okay, you have to trust the person that's going to come at you and cut you open because they're actually going to cause minimal damage. And so that's where you have to trust God in what he's doing because he's good. You can trust him. Don't just trust every person that hurts you, every bad thing that happens to you. But if you know it's from God, if you're praying and you're taking things to God, you can trust God, okay? He's a good surgeon. He will do minimal damage. But we have to accept it. God wounded Jacob. We have to say that. Now we get to move on. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. We have the exchange of names. We have this, you've struggled and prevailed. And then Jacob asks him his name. But he said, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him. Jacob's wound did result in blessing. Now we get to say it. And this almost makes it even more complex. Like, I know I can say this the surgeon illustration, but when we're really talking about someone getting hurt, it's like, it's too easy for me to just say the words, right? The understanding of the depth of this concept, of it's actually 
the wound actually led to the blessing. I need to go to two sources to speak on this before I even say anything. So this is Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 says, Concerning this, he's talking about the thorn in his flesh. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will most gladly boast in all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The other quote I have is A.W. Tozier. He says, The devil, things, and people being the way they are, the brokenness of the world, right? Because of how broken everything is, including me, including all of you, it is necessary for God to use the hammer, the file, and the furnace in his holy work of preparing a saint for true sainthood. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. That quote has been ringing in my head for weeks. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Well, a couple ways to think about this. Once God has Jacob's attention, Jacob is now able to be used greatly. And it just took getting his attention. But God is only able to use you greatly once you depend on him fully. So once Jacob is willing to be dependent and desperate, God is able to use him greatly. Once we are convinced out of our selfishness, our trickery, our scheming, we become useful. But we only do great things through God's great strength, not our own strength. And so, as a sign in this story, as a sign that God is ready to use him greatly, what happens? Well, he renames him. And I think this is amazing. This is proof of the point. Was God able to use Jacob greatly? Well, he renamed him Israel. And if you go look at a map, even today, almost 4,000 years later, there's a country called Israel, right? I mean, obviously, God was able to do something big with this man. And Jacob had a dislocated hip to deal with. But because you struggled with God and with men and have prevailed, that's, that's why he names him Israel. You've struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. I had to figure this out because I still, I still get to this point and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Did he prevail over God? Did he prevail over men? Well, I, I found a great definition of this word prevail. This is, this is a, a tough one, again, to translate out of the Hebrew, but I found this definition of prevail. To be accepted, especially after a struggle. I was thinking of prevail like over, like victory, but really it's more like withstand. Weather the storm and be accepted after a great struggle. He prevailed. Jacob prevailed. So this was sobering when I saw that definition. And so if you're willing, God is able to use you greatly. Now, Jacob has demonstrated he's willing. Finally, God broke his hip, had to do it. Now Jacob's willing to be used greatly. So now we get to figure out he was willing just what is the blessed life? Well, Genesis 32, 30 through 31, Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. He said, yet my life has been spared. So here's his blessed life. The sun shone on him as he passed by the face of God 
limping because of his hip. The blessed life is sunshine and a limp. That's it. Welcome to the Christian life. The sunshine and a limp. You're like, yeah, this is great. I'm limping. It's so awesome. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. What does this blessed life actually look like practically? Because I think it's a little better than just how that sounds. But first, I have to answer the question for you. It's my turn to answer the question. Do you want the blessed life? Do I want the blessed life? Yes. I'm in. God's face, sunshine, I'll take the limp. I'll take the hope that I get. I'll take the the vision for something meaningful in life. I'll take God's protection. Because I know He's strong. And His rod and His staff, if you look at Psalm 23, it's so beautiful. Your rod and your staff. They actually comfort me. Because I know you're willing to fight for the good things. So I'm, I trust God. I'm willing. I'm in on the blessed life. Okay? Veritas Dubuque, you're a young church. What is this church going to be? Is it going to be a perfect church? Or is it going to be a blessed church? Is it going to be a church that limps? I think we should limp. I think here's what it looks like to limp. Vision number one for limping through life. Be honest. That is one of the main things that was missing from Jacob's life up until this wrestling match. He was just not honest. He was tricking. Everything he did was deceptive. Um, I think about people I know with physical pain. There was somebody I was talking to this past week, and we did this sermon in Iowa City last week. And uh, I was talking to one of my friends, and she she suffers chronic pain that there's basically no hope that she's ever going to be done with. And she's young. But her reaction to the sermon is beautiful when she's thinking about this concept of Jacob. And she said, you know, I try to hide my pain. I need to be more honest about my pain rather than trying to hide it because I'm afraid of being a burden to other people because my pain is my strength. And when she's honest about it, we know more about what she's going through. And it's actually even more of a witness to us. The strength that she gets from God is her witness. And the more honest she can be about that, is what she's saying is, that is her witness. She doesn't need to hide that she has pain. She actually needs to be honest and share it. Um, Be honest about your beliefs. Okay, do you struggle with some of the teachings in the Bible? Do you struggle with things you feel like maybe God is commanding you to do? Jesus even struggled with God. There's the moment in the garden where Jesus says, this is Matthew 26, he says, if this cup may pass, meaning if, I, if there's another way we could do this where I don't have to be crucified, but your will be done, Lord. But he wrestled with it. He voiced his, he voiced the question, is there another way? You can ask the question even if the answer is no. Be honest with hard topics. Wrestle with God over things you, you think you're not sure. Does the Bible really teach that? Well, go in, dig in, wrestle with it. God can handle it. He might break your hip, but he can handle it. He'll answer the question for you. And it's better to go to Him. And of course, get in community and talk with other people as well, but, but don't be afraid to go directly to God and take your questions to Him. So be honest. That's vision number one of how to limp through life. Just be honest. Vision number two. You might need to take a little while to write this one down. Cry. Yeah. Jacob had no sensitivity. He had no willingness to kind of wear his emotions until finally his hip gets broken. And I don't, I don't know about you. I'm guessing that hurts when your hip gets dislocated. 
But it seems like he finally gets this like zeal and this passion and this real, real life ignited in this moment. Cry. You don't need to hide things to seem strong. You don't need to hide your limp. You have a limp and you don't need to hide it. And it's okay that you have that. And if you need to grieve it and you need to just cry, that's fine. If you go through things that hurt, you can cry. Okay? I was thinking about this. Um, you know, blessing, you can have a blessed life and still experience loss. We all know this. Um, but the blessed life is the one that prevails through loss and keeps going. Um, people who suffer incredible loss face it, don't bottle it up, stare at it, talk about it. Don't trick yourself out of feeling it. Don't be afraid to seem weak. Better to, better to stare at it and deal with it. I was thinking about this and, you know, in my family, we've, we've had a few too many in the last few years of the car ride to the family member who just lost someone. And I've thought about like, that's one of the hardest car rides to get on. And I'm not even the person who directly lost someone in my household, right? But I've had to drive in the last few years to the daughter, the sister, brother, the parent who has lost somebody. And it's like, that's a hard car ride to go on. You're like, I don't know what I'm going to say when I get there. I'm just going to walk up, see them, hug them, cry. Can't fix anything. That car ride to go do that moment is hard. And it's so worth it. You have to do that. You have to take on that hard moment. And you have to find the kind of strength that, that we're talking about, the kind of thing that we're talking about is like taking on that hard moment and knowing that you don't have anything good to say. It's, it's not weakness to go and have nothing to say. It's strength to go, even though you think you don't have anything good to say. And the person that's there will be glad to see you. Cry to God. Cry with God. Remember John 11.35, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He wept for his friend Lazarus. I think that's part of the blessed life is there's a kind of honesty that's willing to enter into those difficult times. Vision three. Just keep limping. <laughs> you have the limp, but you still got to keep going, right? Don't stop. It's like Dory from Finding Nemo. Just keep swimming. Okay, so this is, this is an interesting one that we can learn from Jacob. After he gets his hip broken and he limps by, you know, the face of God with the sun shining, at least he kept going. At least he kept going and faced his brother Esau. If you read on, actually the reconciliation was good. I, I kind of have some theories. Maybe it wasn't all the gifts. Maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe it was the fact that Esau saw his brother broken finally. His trickster brother was finally broken into being just honest. And maybe that's all Esau ever wanted. Maybe it was the limp that he was honest about as he approached his brother Esau. Just keep going. Okay, I talk about this with my wife. We lead a connection group. And you have every week, you have people come over to your house. And this is something we're going to hopefully get started here in Dubuque soon. You lead a connection group and you're like, all right, here we go, another week. What are we going to do? I don't know. Well, there's one thing I know we shouldn't do every week. Give up. I don't always have the best answer for like, okay, here's the mind-blowing, amazing thing we're going to do tonight. It's going to change everyone's life. More, more often than not, it's like, 
unlock the front door. Okay, come on in. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to keep going. We're not going to give up, right? Parenting, it's the same way. I don't know. I'm not a great parent. We're still early on in this adventure, my wife and I. A lot of days I'm like, I don't know what we should do, but I know that what we shouldn't do is give up. We keep trying. We keep going. We be honest about our weaknesses, and we keep going. The blessed life is not about comfort. Okay, It's about sunshine and a limp. It's about being accepted by a loving Father who's willing to discipline you for your own good and whose face shines on you as you limp through life, loving and serving others. The last vision here, I'm going to let Jesus close out this sermon. Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever by the greatest preacher ever. And now that we've spent this long talking about blessing, and hopefully just recalibrated your thoughts on blessing, I'm just going to read this and just listen. I'm actually just going to go into prayer after this, but Jesus is going to close us out. And this is how he opened this sermon. By talking about what blessedness is. The Beatitudes is what this, is, this section is called, which just means supreme blessedness. So this is Jesus' vision for the blessed life. Jesus is going to close out my sermon for me. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus, Thank you for opening your sermon on the Mount this way by inverting my understanding of blessedness because I personally think way too often about how blessedness is about material possessions, physical comfort, prayers answered the way I want them to be answered, Jesus, you came and you taught us that your kingdom looks different than my kingdom. And so I thank you, Jesus. Especially, I just, it gets stuck in my head all the time. Blessed are those who mourn. There's something about the posture of the people you feel close to and the people you consider blessed that their spirit is one who mourns. That has just stuck with me, Jesus. And yeah, may this, may this word from Genesis and, and even from your Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, may this word reshape our view of blessedness, our view of you, Lord. May we actually draw close to you in a new kind of way by understanding your kingdom better. Um, Yeah, Jesus, your kingdom come and your will be done, not mine.